Hi, this is Bob Weiss. I'm the host of Shaking Your World. Cheers. Welcome home, everybody. We are here again at Shakers, and our intent is to shake your world. I am Bob Weiss, your host. Today, we have the honor to have Dan Newberry with us, who is a vet and a distinguished vet, and he has a great story to tell. Tell me your story. Well, first, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Uh, this by far is one of my favorite places in Milwaukee. If you're ever looking for a good glass of whiskey and a good cigar, obviously Shakers is the place to be. Um, so this is a long story, but I think we got some time. I don't know how much time you got on that tape there. But uh, so the journey started uh, January 2004, joined the military. I was 19 years old, um, kind of fresh out of, the, out of high school. 9-11 had just kicked off, you know, the all the different conflicts that we got involved in. There was Afghanistan and then Iraq happened in March of 2003. And then shortly thereafter, I joined service. Um, ended up liking the military, believe it or not. It was something that I really enjoyed doing. Um, and after, oh, about four or five years, I came to the conclusion that that was what I was gonna do with the rest of my life. And, um, well, it didn't happen that way. I ended up uh, getting hurt in uh, November of 2011 and I got med boarded. And um, what that is, is you go through a medical board process where they review your, your history and determine whether you're fit for duty or not. And I was determined to be unfit given the nature of my spine injuries. Mm -hmm. So within 110 days, I found myself out of the military in a world of hurt. I had, you know, a bunch of debt, a family of, you know, a family of four with one more on the way. Um, and that kind of led to exacerbating, you know, my post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and, and things like that. So um, for the first three years, I, I had a really hard time finding, you know, productive work, uh, work that paid well, work that would, you know, put food on the table for my family. So we lived in poverty and, um, you know, I was getting my food from places like Human Concerns. I was getting suits uh, donated to me from suit drives to, to go get job interviews. Um, ultimately, that led me into the uh, funeral industry. So I was an apprentice and balmer for about two years. And that was, that was really unique situation. And that was a hard situation to be in given that I did have post-traumatic stress disorder. So that too started to play a role in the difficult transition that I was already having. So um, in January, or I'm sorry, in July of 2015, actually yesterday to the day, um, I was sitting on my kitchen floor um, and was ultimately deciding to take my own life. And I started to send, um, you know, goodbye messages to, to my loved ones. Um, luckily for me, the police were in the parking lot of the funeral home that I was living in because we were, we were living in an apartment that was like a two bedroom apartment attached to the funeral home there. Police came in, stopped me before I took the bottle of pills um, and took me to the VA to get help. Um, from there, I seek you know, professional medical care, and to this day, every two weeks, I still see a counselor and, and talk through what's going on. But one thing I realized uh, going through that was, um, you know, I was, you know, the uniform that I wore yesterday didn't define who I have to be today. It was an experience that I had, and those experiences could lead me to do great things. Um, so I took up physical fitness to, to help cope with PTSD, depression, and anxiety, and all those things. And uh, so I started uh, 22 Fitness, which is a free fitness class for the entire community. Um, I did that for about, two, about a year, and then I met Lift for the 22, which is a nonprofit organization that provided gym memberships for veterans. Started working with them, ended up taking over that organization. Um, I also have an apparel line that I ran for several years that uh, was associated with Lift for the 22, so I came out, and, and 22 Fit. I came out with a shirt that said Unbreakable, it sold worldwide and just, just kind of built a brand and it, that, that unbreakable moniker has stuck. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it, the whole purpose behind it just, just states that you're never too broken to lead and you're never too broken to move forward and to become successful. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Wow, that is a great story. And there's other parts that you've left out, your Purple Heart as well before yeah. the injury. Um, I'm not quite sure where I want to begin with this because you got so much to the table. So that defining moment that they took you into the VA mm -hmm. and that really transformed you, got you on the path that you're on today. 
is a great story by itself because you hear often from vets that they're not getting the best treatment at VA right. centers, right? But clearly, they did the right thing with you and pointed you in the right direction. Yeah, I was um, I was fortunate. You know, the the VA has obviously, as we know, it's got a bad rap in the media. Um, here in Milwaukee, though, our VA is very engaged in the veteran community. Milwaukee has a very strong vet community and a very connected veteran community. So we all work together to kind of keep those negative things at bay and to work together to make to ensure that veteran care is productive and impactful. Um, so when I when I got to the VA and I got counseling, you know, the my counselor that I was seeing, he didn't he didn't give me all the answers. You know, he kind of called my bluff on a lot of things and. And one of the things that the pivotal moment really was realizing that um, I'm responsible for my own success and my own happiness. Nobody's going to give it to me. As a service member, I was already getting the benefits that I was ultimately entitled to when I got out. So it was up to me to build off that. It was up, it was up to me to, to, um, to kind of look in the mirror and say, hey, well, what do you want out of this life? The military's past you, man. You've got some bad memories. They're going to haunt you, but it's, it's behind you. You know. You can't keep living back there, otherwise you're gonna live, you know. You're gonna... Today is a new day. Right. Yeah. So, okay. don't get me wrong. You know, I, I still have my my battles and my struggles, but mm -hmm. um, doing things that are productive, using my time value, you know, using mm -hmm. time is valuable. So, mm -hmm. using that to be productive and to build something mm -hmm. is kind of kind of shifted my lifestyle and and where I want to go. So. Remarkable. So obviously you're, you've got to be working with, interacting with people that are, are the vets that have gone through other experiences and maybe some kids as well at some point. Yep. So everything is directed towards, I'm guessing, towards the, the physical activity portion to, to be that mechanism to help yep. you move on. So, man, um, in the time that you were in the military, and you like that experience, what is it about that that really kind of gelled for you? Was it the camaraderie? Was it the mission? Was it the, okay. You nailed it, camaraderie. Okay. Um, that is why I'm a huge advocate for uh, community engagement. Okay. So when I started 22 Fitness, the fitness class, sure it was a level of, of activity and productive um, you know, activity that you were doing. Mm -hmm. um, it was more than just fitness though. Um, Sure, fitness can give you some very valuable skills that I don't think you realize. It can give you things like, one, um, discipline. It takes an incredible amount of discipline to stay in shape, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that's not to say you can't have a burger here and now and then, but still, you still get that. It takes a little bit of discipline to get mm -hmm. there. So, um, and then the initiative and drive and all those little things that you kind of take for granted when you're working out, you can take those same fundamentals, those same, those same basic things and apply it to your everyday life. So that's why I chose fitness as the conduit. On top of that, I made it a group fitness class because I, I firmly believe you don't get anywhere in this world alone. I think it takes a strong community and, and good influential people around you in your circle to help, help build you up and, and you know, kind of get you out of those dark places when you're in them. And I'm walking proof of that. There, I, on purpose, you know, surround myself with people that are doing good things people that are doing productive things, people that are running businesses, people, you know, that, that are like-minded instead of just sitting alone somewhere right. and, you know, living through everything that I've been through over and over and over again. Right. What does the, uh, what does the 22 come in? So 22 stands for the 22 veterans that commit, uh, that take their lives every day in mm. the United States. Uh, that was a statistic that started, I believe, in 2014, 2015 was the initial study. The number has fluctuated since then. It has gone up. It has gone down. Um, but that's kind of where it sure. it stays at. Um, and it's a it's a daunting number if you think of how many people actually serve per capita. So um, it's a lot. And a lot. What contributes? What the main contributor to that that I have seen in all my work through the veteran community, and even what I do now in the veteran community, empowering veteran entrepreneurs. Um, the main catapult to that is tr a hard transition. So guys are getting out without a plan. Um, when they get out, they realize they may not be able to find the dream job that they want right away. Um, maybe they have some financial burdens. Those financial burdens lead to more stress and, and more um, you know, family issues. Right. And then ultimately uh, exacerbates any mental health issue that they, that they already have. Yeah. So. I see that the uh, the green brain known as Captain America just mm -hmm. killed himself as well. Yeah, uh, that was that was one of those. 
I believe he had 13 or 14 deployments, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure, but uh, that was one of those situations where if he's still doing it, he's currently in, what is, the, what is the level of care that these service members are getting while they're currently in? So that tells me that there's still an issue within active military, military service right. that it is uh, taboo to talk about mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So if we can't capture it before they get out, we're not gonna capture it when they get out. Right. Well, it's gotta be difficult to try to reacclimate yourself to society sure. after you've gone through as many tours that he had and uh, obviously your mission when you are a Bray or a SEAL or actually anybody, you're, you're still a warrior, is that your mission is to defuse the enemy. And that often means taking the enemy's life, right? Yep. So after years of doing that and repeat missions and uh, the heroics that go along with that, because you're obviously, uh, I mean heroics in the context of looking out for your fellow soldier as much as your own life, yeah. right? So um, after years of doing that, to try to get back and to think about what you're going to do when you get out or relationship-wise, that by itself has to be almost insurmountable as an obstacle. It is. It's, you know, you're on this constant high. Mm -hmm. You know, you're on this constant, it's, you know, you're just, you're out on mission, you're deployed. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're outside the wire, you're doing your thing, especially, you know, if you're combat arms, you know, if, like I was, I was infantry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you're constantly at this heightened, you know, sense of alertness and you're mm -hmm. just, you're, I mean, you're balls of the wall yep. for a year or 15 months or however long that deployment is. And then when you come home, you got to figure out how to decompress from that. So you got to go from carrying a weapon to a baby. Wow. <laughs> you know, that's, that's night and day. Yeah. It's almost unfathomable to some people. They just, mm -hmm. they're like, what? Mm -hmm. So it's definitely uh, a challenge. Well, I'm glad you worked your way through that, and I'm sure you've had a tremendous impact on many other people as well. Now, the apparel line you got going on, so is that a more of a sports apparel line? Is that just a, an image? Um, oh, by the way, <laughs> we do have a wonderful bourbon here, so before you answer, let's uh, cheers and uh, Yeah, cheers to that. Thank welcome. you. Yeah, so the apparel, I started that in 2017, mm -hmm. and it's kind of just morphed and formed and... Um, it's just a it's just a general slogan apparel. It's um, you know like the the initial pilot shirt was unbreakable. Um, I used to have an e-commerce store, and then I decided to to kind of enable to to allow us to contribute more dollars to the mission. I got rid of the whole warehousing and all that, okay. and now we go direct to retail. So you can buy the shirts at a local uh, store here in the mall, and. Uh, it's, I don't know if you've heard of them, the uh, Frontline Defender, they're in Southridge Mall, so they sell all my stuff in there, and they also put it online. So um, they're really helpful in making sure that we can you know, keep, keep the mission flush. And, but yeah, the, the, it, it started, it's crazy how it started. I, I sold the shirt, I remember I sold like two of them the first day I put them online, I put them on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And then like a week went by and I sold 20, and then 50, and then 500, and then it just kept going and going and going. So. So yeah, it's been it's been great. The the shirt caught on, and in fact, a lot of other major organizations grab their unbreakable moniker and they use it to this day. So that's fantastic. So you know, the army had the uh, the army of one shirt mm -hmm. probably twenty some years ago, right? And I think that the army was was had part of that action as well, right? Yep. I'm not sure that anything went to a decent proceed, but it went back to the army. Um, so, have you had conversations with the Army about your Unbreakable shirt to see if they want to get a piece of that and to move that everywhere? Because that's a huge network. Um, I have. So, dealing with AFES, like, so it mm -hmm. goes to a certain program, Right. Um, it's kind of a struggle. Okay. So, you, you hit a lot of brick walls. Yep. I haven't gotten there yet. Um, I did start talking to uh, Great, Lake, Great Lake Naval Base a little mm -hmm. while ago about getting some stuff in the, in the okay. stores there. So I think eventually that's an avenue that we're gonna we're gonna go to. Okay. Um, with everything that happened with COVID right now, we spent more time. We kind of transitioned from from doing just basic gym memberships and selling T-shirts to helping local nonprofits. Yep. So I started working with the Veteran Chamber of Commerce. Okay. And uh, which Wisconsin's the only state that has that, by the way. Hmm. Yeah. So. Um, and we worked with them, and we raised twenty thousand dollars for other veteran-owned businesses and nonprofits. Okay. So, have you uh, talked to the War Memorial at all? Mm-hmm. Okay. Did you meet Captain Dan here the other day? I did not. Okay. I did not. 
Well, we perhaps have a hookup for you with that. Um, okay. And he was an Iraqi veteran, and um, we had a conversation just the other day about things, and we're going to do the best we can to assist him on some projects. And, and of course, for you as well, we're more than happy to do something. Sure. If you have something in mind that we would fit for a fundraiser for you, we're there. Sure. Of course. I think that would be a great connection in, in more than one way. Um, my, my day job, I work uh, for the uh, Veterans Business Outreach Center. I'm the director for okay. Wisconsin and Minnesota. Okay. And we, our whole program is Boost to Business, and we bring in uh, business owners such as yourself. We have them teach veterans how to start a business. And my goal is to get more um, industry-specific people in, like bars and restaurants. There's a lot of vets out there that want to start a bar or a restaurant. Right. They don't know where to start. So right. guys like you are imperative to, to bring a board. So. And any way I can help, of course, I'd be honored to. So in the time that you were actually in the Army and you're actively engaged and you're outside the wire, what are you thinking about? Obviously the mission. First and foremost, the guys you're with. What else? Honestly, just am I going to make it home? <laughs> you know, is, right. is, I think every day... It was, it was hard because my first deployment was a, was a bizarre deployment because um, we didn't really know why we were there. So in, in January 2005, we honestly didn't ha understand why we were there. So um, it was just driving around aimlessly, really. So then, you know, through that course of the year, I ended up getting hit by an IED in uh, June 28, uh, 2005, and, and, you know, lost a very good friend of mine there. And then after that point, the only thing I could do every time I would go back out was think about that incident. Now, I ended up uh, working for working at a detention center, uh, bringing in detainees and processing detainees and, and being in the room for interrogation and things like that. And um, in all those times, it was just like, why am I here? What are we doing? You know, we're not getting any information. You know, it was very it was a very difficult deployment to be in. Now. That's complete night and day as opposed to my second deployment. Second deployment uh, was during the surge. I don't know if you remember when the surge mm -hmm. happened. Um, and we had a, it was, we were very clear on what we were supposed to be doing and why we were there. But even then, every time I'd go out to the truck and get in the truck, it was like, is it today the day? You know, is today gonna be the day? And you know, the very first thing that happened when we got in the country, when we got to, because we didn't live on a, a base, we didn't live on a farm, as they call them. Okay. We lived in, uh, inside the Muhalas, which is a neighborhood, okay. and we lived in JSSs, and there was only 12 of us, and we would be paired with either another uh, company, or we'd be paired with uh, working with Iraqi police or Iraqi army. Okay. And so that whole deployment, we lived out of our duffel bags, it was, it was a much different environment. And, but it had so much purpose to it, because we we're finding out who lived there, why they lived there, and we were, we were starting to find things that wasn't reported in the media. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, we were finding bomb factories and things that you would never hear about in the media. You know, mm -hmm. the media is always political, if you will. You know, right. Of course. So, but either way, it was a very productive 15 months, and you could see the change. You could see the change in country. So you took all those bad thoughts, but then you got to see your work at hand, and you got to see that you were making an impact within those Iraqi communities, and they were greeting us with open arms, and the roads were being repainted, businesses were being rebuilt. So you're the victors in a way because yeah. you're freeing them, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. So it's not like it was reported. Okay. Um, we did see a lot of good uh, progress mm -hmm. within the area that we were in. I can't speak for the entire country, sure. but I can say that um, in the, you know, Jamia, where we were, was, was starting to grow and flourish economically okay. and socially. Any idea what's going on there now? I do have a, an interpreter that I still talk to. Mm -hmm. Fun fact, uh, he, so I oversaw the commercial recycling division for Goodwill Industries. Okay. And we hired people uh, with, with disabilities or people mm -hmm. that couldn't really find work or whatever. Sure. I was sitting in an office talking to a colleague and all of a sudden I hear my name, Daniel. And I look over and it was my interpreter. So he had come to the United States and um, he, did, he did fill me in a little bit. Um, it's, they're not in a good place. There's still a lot of civil war and things going on, and it's not like when we were there. So Is that ever going to change? You know, in order to... I don't think so. I think in order to change, I think like anything else, if you want to change your country, you're going to have to change your thought process. Right. You know, you're, you were there. We were there trying to change a culture. Right. You know, and until they sort it out amongst themselves, there's no... 
there's no arm army from another country that's going to come in and be able to do it. That's my opinion. Right. You know? Plus, you had so many different factors mm -hmm. taking place and factions and and so many disparate, almost like little fiefdoms that right were yep. engaged. Yep. And there would be, you know, for every and there was a lot of insurgency in Iraq at that time. There was, okay. you know, Egyptians coming in, Syrians, anybody that wanted to take a pop of the United States, they were coming across the border taking a pop of the United States. So. You know, when they, when we, when people would talk about the Iraqi people, uh, a, a good portion of the time they weren't the quote-unquote bad guys. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was other countries that were involved. So, were the uh, Saudis engaged at that time? Mm -hmm. Pro us or anti us? Anti. <laughs> In fact, a lot of the EFPs were coming out of Saudi. Okay. Actually, no, I stand corrected. I'm sorry. I thought you meant Syria. It was, it was Syria that we had a lot of issue with. It wasn't, uh, I do apologize. Because there, I didn't have any interaction uh, with Saudi. It was mostly Syrians. We, there was a big issue with, with EFPs being, being brought across the Syrian border. Yeah. So, everybody wants a piece, right? But it was, was porous, right? I mean, the borders really were just uh, yeah, wide open. Yeah, it was, it, right? They were, it was a free-for-all. So containment maybe would have been the best solution there as you walked into the place to sure. shut it down. Sure, right? You know, but we were so embedded in the communities there to help build their economy mm -hmm. and to help clean out the, the, the insurgency. Mm -hmm. You know, the borders, we did have, you know, if I can remember, I mean, this is 10 years ago, um, there was, you know, there was forces along the border, but mm -hmm. how big are the borders? Mm -hmm. It's no different than trying to contain the U.S. border. You know, you can build whatever you think you're going to build. It's not going to work. If they want in, they're going to get in, you right. know. Well, we've got a problem in this company right now with insurgents as well, don't we? So, oh, my goodness. Uh, it's just a matter of perhaps looking at them in a different perspective than the media wants you to. But uh, um, there certainly is a um, significant movement to debase the country. Our, this, is, this has been the year of I don't know what to think. <laughs> You know, I, I look at, I look at, you know, where we were as a country fundamentally in like 2002 and 2003 to um, where we are now as a country fundamentally. And I feel like we've been turned upside down, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and this is just my personal opinion. It, it's like we, we were once a, a a group of people, a body of people that respected each other and respected each other's differences mm -hmm. and opinions and were able to sit down and have a drink like we are. Mm -hmm. But now we've all got this thing called social media mm -hmm. and everyone hides behind this social media mm -hmm. and they take these dark jabs mm -hmm. at people. And I honestly believe that th those interactions on social media is single-handedly responsible for where we are in present state. And those things come from dark places. Mm -hmm. When people lash out at each other on social media, there's an underlying reason there. It's, it's not that individual conversation. It's, it's, it's coming from within, from something that's hurting them, mm -hmm. and they're projecting it out on everybody else, whether that opinion is right or wrong. In some ways, though, I've seen this before. We had the, uh, the Summer of Love, of course, in the 1960s, right? Yeah. So 68 and 69 were oh, there was all a good about movie touchy feeling. What, what was that? There was a good movie that covered that. Uh, Summer Sam, was it? Mm. I think talked about it. I can't remember. Could be. But, but anyway, so then we had uh, vets coming back to Vietnam who were just treated like absolute crap. You didn't want to admit that you had served in Vietnam because right. you, were, you were the baby killer, right? Right. Me liar or something like that. So it's almost the same kind of thing where we had this warm, fuzzy kind of feeling where most people were getting along just fine and civil rights were kind of moving in the right direction. And, yeah. you know, Martin Luther King was still alive and he was doing his thing to try to unify people. And then we had this change, a significant shift in change. Bobby Kennedy also had been killed and um, people were no longer as, as happy and, and free spirited and, and likable. And things were very destructive in the 70s with returning vets. And uh, then things kind of, you know, mellowed out again. And um, certainly after 2001, people were unified as a country, as you just said. Mm -hmm. And now we're headed in the opposite direction again. So I don't know if that's the nature of people that we have to find a way to break ourselves down or mm -hmm. we're, we're just self-destructive. But, um, you know, this has happened before, maybe not quite to this magnitude. But even in 1992 with Rodney King, we had riots taking place mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, the Watts and 
uh, some major things out east as well that lasted for a long period of time, right? So I, I kind of hope that we're not trying to replicate that and we got this just this replay, replay, reset, that, but it's, it's yeah. not healthy. Yeah, I think we had the perfect cocktail for it though. You know, we, let's, let's look back to um, the beginning of this year. So there's already this idea of this pandemic coming. Right. Um, and fundamentally, we shit the bed. Uh, you know, I don't fucking swear, but we did. You know, we didn't, we didn't really address it until it was like, and then we had all these knee-jerk reactions mm -hmm. of let's just shut everything down right away. Well, quite frankly, you probably could have put measurements in place to present, prevent all that. I don't know. That's just me as a businessman thinking. But, um, but now you take people that are used to being social, that go out every Friday night, Saturday night, Thursday night, they have their leagues, they have all these things that they do to decompress from their job that they hate, and you lock them in their house and you give them nothing but, a, but an iPhone and Tiger King to watch, mm -hmm. right? So here we are. So you do that, months go by. Oh, by the way, here's 1200 bucks. Months go by, still no change, still no change. Okay, let's start to open back up some things, and then you take it away. And then right as Memorial Day weekend's hitting, you have a tragic event, you know, in Minneapolis that takes place. That literally was, you just lit a, a fuse yep. on a bomb. Yep. And that's what happened. Yep. You know, and guess what? People don't have an outlet. People aren't going out and socializing. People aren't doing anything. So what are they doing? They're formulating and they're thinking all these things mm -hmm. in their head and then putting it out there on social media. Now people are really angry and now they're out in the streets. And in many ways, I think we're going the wrong direction mm -hmm. with the uh, Milwaukee mask mandate. Uh, and again, you can go three or four miles away and not do that, right? Right. I so, you know, it, we, again, we're social people. And, and part of that is looking at someone's face, right? And the ability to interpret and read because we all pick up on these nonverbal cues. And you take half that, it's off the table. Right. Plus, then you can't understand people, right? You know, and here's the thing. I, I you know, I can understand... Um, I can understand masks, you know, if you're in passing, mm -hmm. if you're going to a grocery store, a Walmart, a mall, mm -hmm. and things like that. But if you come into a social environment like this, mm -hmm. you are within the understanding you can get a cold. Mm -hmm. You are in the understanding that you can get sick. Mm -hmm. So that's a risk that we have taken every day for centuries. Yep. So to, for, to say for this establishment, we're gonna fine you $500 if your patrons aren't wearing masks. Well, they're trying to communicate, drink, have a cigar, eat some delicious food. You can't do that with a mask on, mm -hmm. you know? So stay home is what they want again. So they don't have the balls per se to shut things down again. What they're gonna do is at the soft shutdown and yeah. put the onus upon the business owner, whatever it might be, and now we're responsible to police the activity. Which right, is, which is hypocritical hip because businesses exactly. businesses are private entities. Correct. You can't sit there and say this is for the public, but then enforce a private entity right. to, to enforce that mandate. Right. That's hypocritical. Honestly, I this is my personal idea and suggestion, and this is conversations I've had time and time again, um, put your mandates out there, but it's not on the business to police it at all. And here's the thing, if, if people want to wear a mask, then wear them. I, have no, I, I don't have any objections to wearing a mask. Look, my daughter has severe asthma and things mm -hmm. like that. So, so typically, if I'm going to a high-risk area, like like a Walmart or a sure. store or something, I want to slap one on my face. Of course. But if I'm coming out to eat, I'm willing to take the risk, mm -hmm. and I know that I'm going out with like, people I know. Mm -hmm. And there is not a business in Milwaukee that I have been to that hasn't taken the steps to social mm -hmm. distance, that hasn't taken a step to to, to sanitize their business. Mm -hmm. So, to punish them now is is, is just it doesn't make any sense to me. I, uh, well, I, I, I just don't I, understand. I, I naturally I concur, but I think you know punitive is really as you just said is really what the objective is here. So. Um, and, and there's something absurd, and I, I watched several of the news sources uh, both yesterday and, and this morning. And you know, as they go through the procedure, so you must wear a mask as you come in, right? You get seated at your table or at a bar, now you can take it off. You can eat, you can drink, you can certainly smoke cigars, throw a mask on. You have to go to the head, you got to put it on. You have to go to pay your bill, you got to put it on. You interact with someone else, you got to put it on. Mm -hmm. That you. Now you're now taking you away the... It. And every time you do that, you recontaminate, right? Right. And yet you can sit down again and take it off. It's a it's a grab it's absurd. at it's a it's a grab at straw safety measure, right. much like the army PT belt. So <laughs> when I was in the military, we wore a PT belt on camouflage. Okay. Like that made sense at all. Sure. We'd have to walk around a military installation in the middle of war zone in Baghdad with a PT belt on, the most reflective thing you could possibly have. Served no purpose. 
but it gives you a sense of security. And I honestly think that it's a sense of security. So like my organization, we just launched some masks, right? I launched those masks because if it helps somebody feel safe so they can just go out and live their life, fine. Am I launching those masks? Am I putting them out there to the public because, because I believe in this mandate and I think businesses should get fined? Absolutely not. I'm the most pro-business person you'll ever meet. I don't think that, I honestly don't think, we don't, we don't have a society without an economy. Mm -hmm. And people are missing that. People in this country take everything for granted. I've lived in a third world country where there is no economy. And I'm telling you right now, we are going to continue to move in that direction if we continue to to force mandates and we continue to shut down businesses and we don't put measures in place to prevent that from happening. Well back in last year when the when COVID first started came around, they should have sort of been studying it and coming up with vaccines then. Why are we waiting till now? Why are we waiting until you know 130,000 plus people are dead and there's millions of infections? What was the holdup? And that the holdup was nothing more but politics. Mm -hmm. I agree in. So it's on both sides of the table, by the way. Both sides of the aisle have made uh, significant guffaws and, uh, and in many ways have impeded our ability to deal with this virus. And the virus sure. can be a killer, sure. no question about that. Sure. But um, I think that we've really had our head, if not of the sand, then somewhere else. Mm. And, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, I, I agree with you. I, th I, think, I think this whole thing has just been completely mismanaged. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you know, but in um, May, before I took this job that I'm doing now, I was asked to run for state senate. Okay. And it was a serious consideration to okay. the point where I had a team in place and started to collect signatures. The only reason I didn't move forward with it was because of the offer I had to, to help the veteran community become mm -hmm. business owners, and that's where my heart's at. Mm -hmm. One of the main discoveries I had through that process was, um, was just the complete disconnect mm -hmm. Uh, between our, our leaders and our citizens. And there's a giant disconnect there. And so I don't know how we're gonna fix that. Well, the quick answer is term limits. If, if people aren't uh, invested for life, right, uh, then they're gonna have a motivation to do something for the good of the people and then get out because they're gonna be out anyway, right? Right. So I think that would be one thing. Uh, but it's almost like we have royalty in this country. So those people that are politicians Career. are above the law in so many ways. And uh, somehow, some way, that has to change. Yes, yeah. So I, for 10 or 12 years, there's been talk about a, uh, a revolt taking place. And not like the revolt we have right now, but you know, this, this large sleeping giant, the, the silent majority, the, you know, the, the uh, Richard Nixon silent majority, I think is going to wake up at some point. I hope the hell they do. Soon. And uh, you know, this, this tearing down statues or, or paintings or cemeteries, to face the cemeteries, and, and all the nonsense taking place, None, no part of that should be tolerated right. by anybody, Right. not to mention the looting. Protest, I'm all in favor of protest. That's where a country is predicated upon, right? Yep. Free speech. Yep. That changes after 8 o'clock at night, right? Once you start destroying things, that's still a lot of free speech. The game has changed. That's, that's a crime. Um, yep. And that's, and that's another thing, you know. I am all for the First Amendment. And here's the thing, being, being, from the, being in the military, I'm a constitutionalist through and through. Mm -hmm. I may not agree with your expression. Sure. I may not agree that football man kneeled. I may not uh, agree that uh, you know, people are protesting for one thing or the other. But you know what, it's their, it's their right. I fought for that right and I uphold that right. But the second, the second you start taking away someone's livelihood, mm -hmm. you lose my respect, mm -hmm. and you've hijacked your message, and it's no longer productive or impactful. So the only way that anything can ever move forward, I, I'm sure you've been at the table for a business deal or, or two, I'd imagine in your day. Um, the only way you move forward and, and make any type of positive change is through constructive conversation. Mm -hmm. Will it start with protests? Probably. Will it start with lobbying? Absolutely but it takes constructive conversation to make the difference that you want to make, not destroying people's lives. Dan, I think that um, after you spend the appropriate amount of time helping vets reestablish themselves, you should really reconsider that run for Senate or some other office because I think you have a message that you could help not just the veteran community, but uh, the entire community. You are an incredibly well-balanced and uh, thoughtful person of the many that I deal with. More Blantons, I hope, by the way. Yeah. To, um, oh, no, this keep, is fantastic. Thank you. Here, so.
break away from uh, this for a moment. What about sure. food? What do you like for food? Oh. MREs, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could go another day with <laughs> never having one of those. Um, so food, I am a, I'm a billy goat. I really like anything. Um, I low-key like to cook, so it's one of my little hidden talents. Um, my, my spouse gets mad at me because she keeps, she's like, you're making me gain weight. I'm like, well, you keep eating it, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, uh, um, I, I'm a huge, you know, steak guy, you know, Cajun cuisine. I love Mexican food. Like, I think, I think me and tacos have a second marriage. But, yeah, so definitely, but you put me in front of a steak, it's game on. So, cool. Your um, your best meal uh, that I make? No, no, no. That you've had somewhere else. That I've had somewhere else. Then we'll do yours. Oh, so. And this is no blowing smoke up your butt here, but uh, I really love your Cajun meatballs here. Thank you. Like that is like, <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. That's I'm a, so I'm a sucker for just meatballs in general. Sure. You know, you get the jelly ones sure. with the chili sauce or whatever, but Cajun meatballs. Um, I'd have to say if I'm gonna go for like a, a quick bite at a, at a at a like a bar or, or a place to have a drink, I would say here for the Cajun meatballs. Um, other than that, I, I've I'd have to say the one of the best steaks I've had was at a place called Dominic's down in um, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Had a fantastic steak down there, and it was I mean it was like. Ribeye, porterhouse, uh, I'm a ribeye guy. Okay. Bone in ribeye, like a big cowboy. You yep. know. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, the best thing that you make? Fried chicken. Fried chicken. Yep. I do it old school. I taught my daughters how to make it Corn old school. Cornmeal, buttermilk. What do you do Buttermilk. Doing buttermilk. Okay. Buttermilk. Okay. And I use a cast iron skillet. Uh -huh. Get that temperature just uh -huh. right. And take my time. It's, I, good, don't, good I, I do not burn any chicken. Do you do the two-step process, like bake first and then you fry? No, no. no I, I oh. double bread. Okay. Um, and it's all done in a paper bag, okay. like real old-fashioned. Cool. Yeah, it's probably one of my favorite things to do. In fact, when we were quarantined, I taught my daughters how to do it. So there's a video of all of us standing around with chicken in, a, in paper bags. Man, the family of the cooks together. That's a, that's a beautiful yeah. concept. Good for you. And how old are your kids? I have all girls. Okay. Uh, 14, lucky, 12, and 7. <laughs> Let me tell you. But <laughs> so my middle one, my 12-year-old, she is just like me. She, um, she's super outgoing, and she'll talk to anybody, and the, but the boys love her. And so I wanted to be that dad that cleans guns, but because I, I like to box and do mixed martial arts and things, I just put pictures all over the house of, like, my fights and, or whatever I've yeah, done. Yeah, get the message. Yeah. yeah, they get it. And I don't even have to say anything. And they're super respectful when they yep. come over. <laughs> yep. Good for that. Cool. So if you had the opportunity to be anywhere in the world right now, where would it be? Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Which coast? I don't know yet. I just want to go see it. I have a friend that lives there, and she posts these pictures all the time. And I'm like, I want to go there. It's beautiful. So, and, and, and my friend just approached me recently. We were in here talking about it. He wants to buy an Airbnb down there, and that's why I invest with him. I'm like, well, maybe. Let's go to Costa Rica. Keep me in mind for that. I like Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we're able to travel like humans again. So last time I was in Costa Rica, I was uh, still engaged at the time, and uh, we're in this lovely little resort, if you will, but it's not a resort. It's, it's a main building, yeah. which has a restaurant, has the bar, and five little... El Chac kind of things, right? We're on the second highest mountain in Costa Rica, Pacific side. And uh, we spend, you know, we're two days in the jungle, and the second day we're drinking with the owner who's an expat from California, John. And uh, we're, we're well gassed up. I mean, we've been in the jungle all day. It's 100 degrees, and we're, we're drinking. We're drinking, we're drinking. His uh, restaurant shuts down at 9 o'clock, and about 10 o'clock or so, this party of 10 or 12 walks in. It's the Costa Rican ambassador. They're there for dinner. So he looks at me and he says, um, can you help me out? Because he knows what I do. I said, sure, where's the kitchen, right? So it's over there. You got one dishwasher left. Doesn't speak English. The Spanish I speak is not what he speaks. But here we are. I have no idea where anything is, right? So, well, my girlfriend goes and entertains the 12 top to help John around with uh, you know, drinks, whatever else. Uh, I make it food. So I do this multi-course kind of meal, just pulling stuff out of my butt and, and the coolers, whatever else. 
and uh, the next day they invite us to breakfast at the ambassador's house. So it's he and his wife are there and made breakfast for us, mm -hmm. and he has a business partner there. And uh, this is one of the, if I had regrets, and I really don't, but this is something I should have done. So they're showing uh, pictures, and they've got all sorts of uh, aerial uh, shots of this development that they're doing on the Pacific Coast. And um, they had just put in this helipad, and like next month the airstrip is going on, in, and they've got uh, dockage for 400-foot yachts coming from you know Singapore or somewhere. And uh, they decided they're going to put two restaurants there, and, and they asked me to do one of those. And I said, you know, just thank you very much, not my league, whatever else. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, it's not going to cost you anything. We did our discovery on you. We want you to be one of these guys. And I'm like, well, what I really want to do is open up in Cuba. I've had a thing for Cuba for years. I've been down before it opened up, and I like Cuba. So we go on back for a couple hours, and you know, finally he just walks over, picks up the phone, and he calls the Cuban ambassador and says, I've got a guy you got to meet. So... We're there in April, and now it wasn't until September that I got to Cuba. Now I'm cooking for the Cuban ambassador in Cuba. And uh, I really like Cuba, but it's a vacuum, and there's all sorts of issues there. But just the opportunity to be out of this environment, be somewhere else, is extraordinary. But Costa Rica, I'd, I'd highly suggest you okay. go and enjoy that. Okay. So, But the jungle is really the cat's ass there. Okay, I'll have to take your word for it. I, I think um, I'm looking at October. Okay. So we'll connect more on that because I want to cool. hear a little bit more about Costa Rica. So cheers, cheers to that. Um, long story short, I need to travel. I, I spent last year doing a uh, doing a national tour for Lift for the 22. We went to multiple different states uh, doing these resource fairs. And what we would do, we'd do the 22 fitness workout there, and I'd invite all these people like all these resources to come in, like mental health resources, veteran resources. We'd have vets show up and get, start getting their VA benefits right then and there. So it's really cool. But the one thing I really enjoyed about that tour was going to all these different states and meeting all these different people from all walks of life and, and like trying all the different restaurants there. Like that was my, I was, on a, I was on a steakhouse kick at the time. And man, that's probably my favorite thing to do is when I do travel is find like, what's the steakhouse? You know what I mean? Like, where, where do, what's the best place in town? You can really identify much about a culture, by, by, in my mind at least, by two things. One element, first and foremost, is food. Absolutely. And, and how they interact with food, how they source the food, what they do with the food. And the second is music. And I think that that really sets a tone for so much. And yeah. how you are going to comport yourself and yeah. they comport yourselves and how you interact with things. And then probably art after that. You go to like places like Colombia and uh, Medellin, and they've just got street art everywhere. It might have been drug money that got it there, but it really at some point doesn't matter because they just got these beautiful things yeah. that are everywhere. Who cares how it got there? It's beautiful, yeah. right? I, um, you know, that's a, that's a good point because when I, uh, I was in Florida, uh, I went down to um, Fort Lauderdale mm -hmm. and we did a, we did an event down there at um, Brain, I'm brain farting on the gym, but uh, Evolution Fitness and we went down there and a gentleman walks up to me, he goes, you're from Wisconsin, aren't you? And I'm like, how do you know? He's like, you walked around and talked to everybody. And I think there's something about our culture here where just in, especially in like Milwaukee, just, just everyone here is so quick to like, hi, I'm so-and-so. And like, they're so personable. And I've been to other states where it's like, I'm, you know, you go to New York, I don't talk to anybody. You mind oh, your own business over there. No, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> Kick you to the curb. You're on fire. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And even Chicago, go, go, right. down to, go, down to, <laughs> go down to Chicago. Although I don't recommend anybody go to Chicago right now. Not, no, no. Yeah. Not the Soviet Republic of Chicago. But uh, I go down there and I'm like, ugh. You know, it's just not as friendly. So, but it does, you're right. I think, I think you can tell a lot about a place mm -hmm. by their food and, you know, just the mm -hmm. demeanor of the people, you know. Good, good observation. Speaking of that, mm -hmm. Iraqi people are some of the nicest, kindest, most genuine people you'll ever meet. We, um, there was times when we were stopped, we were caught, you know, we were in our JSS, mm -hmm. and we had what was called log pack that would come in every day and bring us our food. Okay. Well, on several occasions, uh, the routes would be red, which means they were too hot to drive on, right. which means if you, you get you down the road, you get hit. Right. And there's a certain period of time in 07 where, I mean, we were in firefights all the time and we were, you know, people get blown up left and right. And we just could not seem to get off the island, if you will. 
It was our Iraqi neighbors that we were living in this little house and our Iraqi neighbors were bringing over plates of food to make sure that the U.S. troops ate. You know, that speaks a lot. That speaks volumes about those people. It does. It also speaks volumes about the media because they don't report that. Absolutely that's not, that's no. not the impression you have. Mm -mm. Hmm. It's of no benefit to their ratings to right. report anything good. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Cool. So what's next in your list? I mean, in the next six months, what do you need to accomplish? What are you going to accomplish? So the next six months, um, I think my main thing right now is establishing a network in Minneapolis. That's a personal goal of mine. Uh, there's a heavy veteran population there that's severely underserved. Um, so I want to start working out there quite a bit. Um, personally, I'm, I'm involved in a couple different business ventures that I'm, one I'm researching and the, and the second um, is gonna come to fruition. So I'm looking at doing a fundraiser beer soon with a local um, brewer. So that's really exciting. I'm excited to do that. Um, and then next is uh, whiskey. So a little personal thing, I wanna get in the whiskey business. So I've got a really cool, my old man passed away in um, you know April 2012 and he was a big influence in my life and um, you know, all the times that I was deployed and stuff like that, I'd hear him, you know, barking in my ear. My dad was old school. He's, you know, born in 1939. He was a Texan, and, but he loved everybody. My, my family's a very mixed family. We had 21 different foster kids come Oof. in and out. Wow. Um, uh, one of them, uh, my little brother, Will, um, he was, you know, he was half black, half white, mm. and uh, he struggled a lot, and I lost him to suicide in mm. uh, December 2015, actually, right when I was coming back on my stuff. But... You know, I have a very strong like connection to my to my father, and because of his teachings, I was able to overcome those. So I want to come up with a whiskey and call it Papa Bob's, and, and nice. kind of dedicate it to him. So I'm, I'm currently researching the the best way to go about it: either pay the astronomical amount to to start completely from scratch, or look at private labeling. So we're gonna I'm gonna take a peek at what's the best route there. Cool. Well, let's get into that. If you uh, need some recommendations or thoughts, I'd be more than happy to, oh. to tell you what to do. But I, you know, I, I live this stuff every day. I, exactly. So. <laughs> so I've come to the right place. I was going to pick your brain about it, anyways. Cool. Very, very cool. That's exciting stuff. So I, I, we want all your links, obviously, to put them up. And so it's not just that the uh, the Shakers channel is moving ahead on on YouTube, but we've been picked up by iHeartRadio as well for the all podcast. Standing. So. As of this week, I think we're now national or international, whatever we might be. But um, if we could do some good for you, we'd, we'd like to be part of that. So. Sure. I, I really appreciate that. And likewise, I, I think it's reciprocal. I'll share whatever I, you know. And um, every time I'm here, I always make sure, hey, come down here, you know. And Maybe one day, Dan, we should uh, put you to work working one of the, uh, the event dinners as well. Sure. Sure. I have no problem doing that. I, cool. You know, anytime I can get involved with... You know, our, our communities, businesses, I mean, this this place, you know, I don't know how much your viewers know about Shakers, but this is like a staple here. This is one of the places if, if I have people all the time reach out to me and say, hey, I'm coming to Milwaukee, where should I go? Shakers. People come up here for their bachelor parties, Shakers, you know what I mean? It's just, so anything I can do to help and support. I truly appreciate that as well. But uh, at some point, let's talk about that, that Senate campaign or something else as well, because you have, again, you have uh, a je ne sais quoi. You got a certain something about you. You got a spark for life. You got the experiences. And certainly, you have a vision as to where you want to go and whom you can help along the way, which I think is remarkable, because you're not just looking out for yourself. You're looking out for, for yeah, the vets. You're looking out for everybody, man. At the end of the day, it's, you know, it's, we, don't, we don't get through in this life without others we just we just don't and we've got to get to the point where we're about people over policy it's just we've got to get there otherwise we're just not going to continue to flourish you know this this country was founded on, on you know free speech freedom of enterprise and all these and all these wonderful things give me your tired you're sick you're hungry you're poor where's that gone you know so that's that's the only reason I've entertained politics um, I'm not a career politician but if that's a sacrifice that I need to do to ensure that my kids and other people's kids have a better future, then that's what I'll do. Let's find a way to bring that back because uh, our, our society needs that tremendously right now. So we need people like you that, uh, that have that vision. Cheers. It's Cheers. been great having you. Thank you. Look forward to the next time. Absolutely. Thank you.